Today on Touching Lives. Because you know what grace does? Grace drops rocks. Grace walks away from rocks. Grace will take you out of the rock throwing business. So when you come to Jesus with all of your brokenness, you come to Jesus with all of your guilt, you come to Jesus and you're guilty as charged. He'll give you grace. With hope and encouragement for life, this is Touching Lives with James Merritt. I want you to turn to the Gospel of John, the eighth chapter. The passage we're going to study, by the way, is very interesting for more than one reason. Maybe if you have a version of the Bible like I do, I happen to use this particular version, but you, you may notice that in your version of the Bible that that passage that we're going to look at beginning in John 8, chapter, uh, ch chapter 8, verse 1, is in brackets. And the reason why it's in brackets is because this story is not found in some of the, of, of the oldest available manuscripts of the New Testament. And so there are some people who have said through the years, this story really didn't happen. It really doesn't belong in Scripture. We really shouldn't study it. We really shouldn't preach about it. And, and I happen to be uh, one of those, many, by the way, that does agree with that. And without going into great detail as to why we are going to study this story, why I do believe it happened, is number one, because there are, there are a lot of conservative biblical scholars who believe this story did take place, because even though it's not in some of the oldest manuscripts, it is in the very best available manuscripts. And I don't want to get too technical, because it wouldn't mean anything to you, but I took textual criticism in the seminary. It's a fascinating discipline. And if, if you knew textual uh, criticism, you would realize that, yeah, even though it's missing in some of the oldest, in some of the very best manuscripts that we have, some that go all the way back to about 50 years after Christ was crucified, this, this story is found. The other reason why I believe it's true and biblical scholars believe it's true is because knowing what we know about Jesus, when you read this story, it just sounds like Jesus. It, it just sounds like, you know, that's exactly what I would think that Jesus would do. So, it really does fit the context of what happened before and what happened afterward. So we're going to read the story beginning in verse 1. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning he came again to the temple. All the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery, and placing her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now, in the law Moses commanded us to stone such women, so what do you say? This they said to test him that they might have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. And as they continued to ask him, he stood up and said to them, Let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And once more he bent down and wrote on the ground. But when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones. And Jesus was left alone with a woman standing before him. Jesus stood up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, sin no more. See, your life is kind of like a tile. When you're born, you're born whole. You're born kind of with it together. But somehow, somewhere along the way, something happens. And your life is just absolutely broken. It's just broken. I mean, for example, you, you got married. You meant to hold it together. You tried to hold it together, but you didn't hold it together. And you're married. I'm going to break this thing. <laughs> Boom! Your marriage was broken. Or, here's one. You were sexually abused as a child wasn't your fault. And ever since that time, you have really struggled with your emotions. And you come in, and it looks like you got it together, but deep inside, you're broken. Or you were introduced to alcohol at an early age, and you're one of the ones that didn't become a moderate drinker. You became a problem drinker. And you're still a problem drinker, and you try to hide it, but your wife knows it, or your kids know it. And even though you look like you've got it together, you're broken. And you just, you know, you just can't. Or you may say, you may be one of those people and you'd say, you know what? <laughs> this is my favorite part. <laughs> you're here today and you're saying, you know, it's not what happened to me in the past that broke me. It's, it's what's in my life right now. 
It's the affair that I'm having with my outside of my marriage. It's the pornography I'm addicted to. It's that bitterness I still have because she divorced me and I didn't want it. It's the anger I still have toward that dad because he never, ever gave me the affection that he gave my sister. He never gave me the attention that he gave my brother. And I am one broken person. Well, if you've ever blown it, if you've ever failed, if you've ever taken the wrong road, you've ever made the wrong choice, you've ever gotten caught in the act, and you're broken, you need to listen to this story. Because what you're going to take out the door this morning is this. Jesus takes brokenness and turns it into blessing. He does. As a matter of fact, can I tell you this? Jesus specializes in broken people. He loves meeting broken people. Uh, how many of you just out of curiosity, how many of you play golf? How many of you play or play at golf? Okay. You know, I have a saying sometimes when I hit a bad shot, I just say to myself, some days you're the statue and some days you're the pigeon, right? <laughs> I mean, some days, you know, you know what I'm talking about? You hit the good shot, you're the statue. You hit the bad shot, you're the pigeon. Well, some days are just like that. And so, you, you know, you, you, you've, got this, you've got this situation where you've been caught in the act or you've caught someone in the act, you either got caught and somebody's about to rock you, or you got caught and you, or you caught somebody and you want to rock them. I want you to listen to what we need to do. When our lives are lying on the floor in broken pieces, or we're having to deal with a broken person, I want you to listen to what we learn out of this lady, this unbelievable lady in the New Testament. Number one, here's what we learn. When you come to Jesus, He'll give you grace. When you come to Jesus, He'll give you grace. Now, the story takes place early in the morning. Let me give you the kind of the background. Jesus is actually outside the temple. <clears throat> He's actually in a small group. There's a small group. They've come for a Bible study. So they're right in the middle of studying the Bible. And all of a sudden, the mortal enemies of Jesus, the scribes and the Pharisees, they show up and, 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 and dragging behind them naked, by the way. You need to get this picture here. Dragging behind them naked is this woman. Now, they didn't come to listen to Jesus teach. They came to lasso Jesus in a trap. And they burst into this Bible study. They're dragging this naked woman behind them. She's been caught in the very act of adultery. Now, what you're going to see is the Pharisees really weren't concerned about the woman. That really was not their focus. She was just kind of a, a, kind of a pawn on the chessboard of this confrontation. She was the appetizer. Jesus was the main course. Okay? Verse 2. Early in the morning he came again to the temple. All the people came to him and he sat down and taught them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery. And placing her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now in the law Moses commanded us to stone such women. So what do you say? The Pharisees know she's guilty. The scribes know she's guilty. The people know she's guilty. She knows she's guilty. Jesus knows she's guilty. Everybody knows she's guilty. Now, these Pharisees are grinning like a Cheshire cat because they say, we got you now. You're caught. There's nowhere to turn, nowhere to run. Because now, three things are at stake. Number one, the law of Moses is at stake because the law is very plain. Go back to the Old Testament. If you're caught in adultery, both the man and the woman are to be stoned to death. The law is very plain. The life of the woman is at stake because if the law is to be carried out like the law is supposed to be carried out, this woman is going to die right there in that spot. The love of Jesus was at stake. Because if Jesus says, well, you're right, that's what the law says, so I guess we have to kill her, then everybody's going to now know he really isn't the friend of sinners that we thought that he was. So, what is Jesus going to do? I mean, I'm telling you, you could hear grass growing outside, it was so quiet. What is he going to do? And this is one another reason I love Jesus. Typical Jesus does something shocking. Verse 6. This they said to test him that they might have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. Now, while they're building their case against this woman, Jesus is building his case against them. And, 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 and instead of passing judgment on the woman, he's passing judgment on the judges. Verse 7, 
And as they continued to ask him, he stood up and said to them, Let him who is without sin among you cast, or be the first to throw a stone at her. And once more he bent down and wrote on the ground. But when they heard it, they went away one by one. By the way, little, 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 little side note, beginning with the older ones. I'll tell you why I think he put that in there in a minute. And Jesus was left alone with a woman standing before him. Now, here's what, get the picture. Here, it was obvious. Every Pharisee had a rock. They are ready to clock this woman right between the eyes. One guy says, I'm going to use the slider. One guy says, I'm throwing the curve. One guy says, I'm going with the fastball. And then all of a sudden, the crowd starts hearing this noise. And these rocks start dropping like flies. And a rock drops here, and a rock drops there. And then one by one, beginning with the older ones. Why did the older ones go first? Because they're experienced. They're veterans. The younger guys are too stupid to get it first. So the young guys, the older guys say, we think we need to get out of here. We think we need to leave, right? So one by one, they're all left when they're confronted with their sin. The Pharisees were in the rock-throwing business. Jesus is in the grace-giving business. And may I just tell you something? Every one of you finds yourself every day in one of two businesses. You're either in the rock-throwing business or you're in the grace-giving business. Every church in this country is either in the rock-throwing business or the grace-giving business. Jesus said, I'm in the grace-giving business. They were in the guilt business. He was in the grace business. See, because you know what grace does? Grace drops rocks. Grace walks away from rocks. Grace will take you out of the rock throwing business. So when you come to Jesus with all of your brokenness, you come to Jesus with all of your guilt, you come to Jesus and you're guilty of, as, as charged. He'll give you grace. That gets better. When you confess to Jesus, He'll remove your guilt. When you confess to Jesus, He'll remove your guilt. Now, I want you to get this in your mind. Let this picture burn in your heart. Rocks have been dropped, dropped. feet have shuffled away. Now nobody is left. Just Jesus and this woman. Everybody's gone. Just Jesus and this woman. Jesus stands up, looks her in the eye, and He says in verse 10, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, sin no more. Did she deserve the rock? You better believe it. The law of Moses says so. She deserved it. Was he qualified to throw the rock? He was absolutely qualified. You say, okay, explain something to me. I don't get it. She deserved the rock. Yep. He was qualified to throw the rock. Yep. Then why didn't he throw the rock? Two reasons. Number one, the cross. It wasn't going to be very long that the man who was perfect was going to die for the woman who was not. It wasn't going to be very long that this man standing before her was going to say, can I tell you why I don't condemn you? Because I'm about to take your condemnation. Do you know why I'm not going to give you the, why I'm going to take your, why you're not guilty as far as I'm concerned? Because I'm about to take your guilt. And by the way, I want you to notice what he didn't say to her. He did not say to her, now if you will guarantee me from now on, you will live a perfect life I won't condemn you. See, this is what I love about Jesus. I just love this about Jesus. I wish I could have seen the picture of the look on that woman's face. Jesus and this woman's left alone. The jury is gone. All of a sudden, she's left the courtroom. Now she's in the judge's chambers. She's awaiting the verdict. She already knows she's guilty. She just wants to know what the sentence is going to be. She's pleading guilty, and Jesus says, I don't condemn you. Let me tell you something. If you ever wonder, how does God react when you blow it? How does God react when you drop the tile? How does God react when you're guilty? How does God react when you mess up? You ought to frame these words on the wall of your heart. Because when you fess up with your mess up, Jesus takes your guilt from you. Neither do I condemn you. And he doesn't say, now I'll tell you what, if you'll guarantee me from now on you'll live a perfect life, I won't condemn you. He didn't say to her, you clean your act up, you get yourself together, and then I won't condemn you. That's not what he said. Here's what he said. Okay. I don't. Now you don't. I don't condemn you. Now you don't sin anymore. Because when you confess to Jesus, he will remove your guilt. Now this is so important, you just can't miss this. What did Jesus do with the Pharisees? Think about this. What did he do with the Pharisees? He reveals what they concealed. He wrote their sins on the ground. He reveals what they concealed. What does Jesus do with the woman? He repeals what they revealed. So amazingly, this is, what, this is the irony of this story. These self 
righteous, religious, hyper-spiritual Pharisees, they walk away condemned, and this guilty, adulterous woman walks away forgiven. And that's the way it works. If you reject Jesus, you're going to walk out of here with your guilt. But if you confess to Jesus, you'll walk out of here with His grace. Now, I have to be honest with you. This is where a lot of you would like to leave this story. You, there's a lot of you out there right now, you'd say, now that's the Jesus I know. Man, that's the Jesus I love. That's the Jesus that I like. That's the Jesus I want to hear about. I like to hear about that Jesus that says, well, now where are your accusers? Well, Lord, they're all gone. Well, but no, they're not all gone because I'm still here. Oh, yeah, Lord, I forgot. That's right. And you know, I'm qualified to condemn you. Yes, Lord, you are. But you know what? I don't. And everybody goes, can we just now go home and eat lunch? Now can we go to the restaurant, please? I mean, the Methodists are just about to get out. Would you please just kind of hurry up and <laughs> let us go? I can't do that because that's not where the story ends. Because there's one last thing that Jesus will do with your brokenness. When you come to Him, He'll give you grace. When you confess to Him, He'll take away your guilt. But then you commit to Jesus, and He'll lead you to goodness. Now watch how this works. This, this is going to be worth coming to church for, I trust me. Everybody's left. Evidently, even the Bible study group, they've left too. And it's just Jesus and this woman. And here are the last words He ever says to this woman on this earth. Go, and from now on, sin no more. That one statement helps to clarify this big misunderstanding that a lot of people have in the church, that a lot of people have about Jesus, that a lot of people have about grace, that a lot of people have about salvation, that a lot of people have about Christianity. Let me tell you what that is. We've all heard the saying, and I'll let you, I'll, you, you, you can fill that blank in, God loves the sinner, but God... I mean, God, you know, God loves the sinner, but God, right, hates the sin. Or, God hates the sin, but God loves the sinner. All right, we've heard that, right? I want to, here we go. That's an absolutely theologically true statement. God loves the sinner, but God hates the sin. And as you're going to see in just a moment, now this is important, watch this. Was this woman's sin forgiven, yes or no? It was forgiven. But it wasn't excused. Big difference. Woman said, oh, it was forgiven, but it wasn't excused. Because let me tell you what Jesus didn't do. Jesus didn't do what a lot of people wish He would do. He didn't go, that's all right. Boys will be boys. <laughs> girls will be girls. Jesus doesn't weak at sin. Does He condemn her? Nope. Does he condemn her sin? You better believe it. He loved her, but he hated what she did. Now, here's what I want you to understand, because I've heard this story misquoted so many times, ad nauseum. This story does not teach, well, you can't call wrong, wrong. I mean, you, you drop, drop your rock. You, you just, you know, you, you can't do that. It doesn't teach that we cannot judge the sinful actions of other people. Because Jesus was not asking <laughs> that only sin sinless people judge other people, because He was the only sinless person there. He still judged this woman's sin. And what you learn from this story is just the opposite of what a lot of you have always been taught, what a lot of you have always thought. This story does not teach, well, you can't call anything wrong if it's wrong. You can't call sin, sin, because if you're, you're, you know, you'd be throwing a rock. Just the opposite. We not only have the right to condemn what the Bible condemns, we have the responsibility to condemn what the Bible condemns. That's, that's our job. No, I'm not to judge the thief, but I'm to judge his stealing. I, I'm not to judge the liar, but I'm to judge his lying. <clears throat> I'm not to judge the adulterer, but I'm to judge his adultery. I, I'm not to judge the homosexual, but I'm to judge his homosexuality. Condemning the sin is not the same as judging the sinner. And Jesus said two things at the same time, and they both go together. He said, woman, I don't condemn you, but I do condemn what you did. Go and do it no more. Now listen, 
I want you to write something down. If you're accustomed to taking notes, it's because if, write this in the margin of your Bible, right there by, that, by this little passage there. Big bold letters. I want you to listen to this. God loves us just the way we are, but He loves us too much to let us stay that way. The reason why Jesus gives us grace and the reason why Jesus removes our guilt is to lead us to goodness. And the reason why God forgives us of our sin is so that we will learn not to sin, not so that we can go out and continue to sin. You know, there's, a, there's this verse in Psalm chapter 130, verse 4, I thought I'd put it up on the screen because you probably haven't read it in a long time. But listen to what this verse says. But you offer forgiveness that we might learn to fear you. Now that kind of sounds contradictory. God says, I offer you forgiveness, and here's why I offer you forgiveness. I want to forgive you, not so that you'll say, wow, so I can go do whatever I want to do, and I can get forgiven, and everything's cool. He says, oh, no, just the opposite. When I forgive you, it should teach you to fear me. I was talking to somebody just the other day, and you know what he said to me, and it just broke my heart. He said, well, I'll tell you what, if I decide to take this course of action, I'll do it, and then ask God for forgiveness. Sorry, it doesn't work that way. And if that really is your heart, you are a million miles away from God. You don't get it. Forgiveness is not a get out of jail free card. Okay, I'll go do this. I'll commit adultery on my wife today and I'll confess it to God and get forgiveness tomorrow. No, that's not the way it works. Once you come to God with your brokenness and once He puts your brokenness back together, you don't want to do that anymore. Guilt and grace leads you to goodness. See, this woman was not sorry because she had, got, she had gotten caught. She was sorry because she was now converted. She had been convicted and she had been converted. She wasn't just remorseful. She was repentant. So, you remember I told you that you're in this story? Okay, let's just see which part of the story that you play. Because here's the truth, and some of you are not going to like this, and it's going to be real hard for you, some of you to swallow. But here's the truth. And it's true about every one of us in this room. It's true about every one of you watching this on television. It's true about every one of you that would be watching this on a computer or listening by way of the internet. You're either the Pharisee or you're the woman. I don't know which one you are, but you're either the Pharisee or you are the woman. Maybe you're the Pharisee. You still carry this bitterness and this anger toward that spouse that walked out on you. Toward that spouse that committed adultery behind your back toward that spouse that didn't meet your needs, toward that parent who neglected you, who favored your brother or your sister, toward that boss that unfairly terminated you, toward that school that didn't accept you, toward that in-law that acts like an outlaw. And you carry a rock around in your hand every day of your life. You're the Pharisee. It's time for you to drop the rock. But maybe you're the woman. You're broken. You're guilty. You did it. And you've never gotten over it. Your life was shattered and broken many years ago over something you did, and the pieces of your life are still falling on the floor every day. You need to drop the rocks of guilt. And I want to tell you something. I know you're sitting there saying, you're saying you, you don't know what I've done. No, I don't. And you don't know what somebody did to me. No, I don't. But I am telling you right now, if you want to live a miserable, rotten, terrible life, you stay in the rock-throwing business. Because only miserable, unhappy people throw rocks. But I'll tell you, once you meet Jesus, I'm telling you, you just want to get out of the rock-throwing business. You know why? It's a lot sweeter. It's a lot more pleasant. It makes you a lot happier to be in the grace-giving business than it does to be in the rock-throwing business. So if you're broken today, or, or, or maybe you need to be broken today, all I'll tell you is this, if, you, if you'll come to the one who died on the cross and who came back from the dead and who still says with open hands that are empty of rocks but full of grace and love, if you come to me, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll give you grace. I'll take away your guilt, and I'll lead you to goodness because you know what I know how to do better than anybody that's ever lived? I know how to take all these broken pieces I know how to turn them into blessing. Because you remember these broken pieces? Let me tell you what Jesus wants to do with, with these broken pieces. See, some of you think, I know what He wants to do. I've heard this before. Jesus wants to pick up all these broken pieces, and He want, kind of wants to put them all back together in perfect order, and He wants to restore me to what I once was before my life was broken. Absolutely wrong. Jesus does not want to take you back to what you once were. 
He wants to take all these broken pieces and turn you into a whole new creation. A whole new person. A person where all the guilt is gone and all the grace is there. See, Jesus, he wants to take all of these broken pieces. And he wants to turn you into a beautiful mosaic of the person that he wants you to be. He wants to take your brokenness and turn it into blessings. So here's what I'm going to ask you to do. Come to Jesus. He'll give you grace. He'll take away your guilt. He'll lead you to goodness. And He will turn your brokenness into blessing. Grace isn't an easy thing to give sometimes. When someone has hurt us so deeply, so personally, we can find it very difficult to respond to them as Jesus would. If you find yourself struggling with a relationship today, call Touching Lives at 800-413-1131. We want to pray with you and stand with you as you learn to love others as Jesus does. We tend to deal with brokenness in different ways. When it's our mistake, we long for mercy and forgiveness. But when we're faced with someone else's failure, we're often very quick to do without any grace at all. Jesus teaches us to respond to brokenness the way He did, with a kind of mercy that's hard to explain. Discover how to change your mindset about giving and receiving grace with the series On the Fringe. Order your copy today at touchinglives.org or call 800-413-1131. We live in a broken world full of broken people. People who desperately need to hear about the God that loves them so much that He gave everything He had just for them. Because of your faithful prayers and financial support, the Ministry of Touching Lives continues to share the good news of Christ around the world. 